Hello, my name is Richard Fennell and I'm the Engineering Director at Black Marble, a Microsoft Girl partner based in the north of England. As I travel around the country visiting clients, many of them are looking at their DevOps story. They're looking at how they can better integrate their software development lifecycle into their production systems, taking regular deliveries coming out of their development teams, pushing those into production in a controlled and suitably instrumented manner to make it easier for their development teams to provide the new features that their clients want and their IT teams to provide stable, reliable systems. In this session we'll look at the tools that are available inside VSTS to give you a DevOps solution. This can be applied whether you're using Azure or not. So, without more ado, let's have a look at the demo. On the screen you can see the VSTS dashboard. This has been customised a little from the default to highlight the tooling that's available to us. The key main areas we need to consider are the build reports and the release management reports. Now the build reports are available on VSTS and TFS. At the moment the release report the release widget for the dashboard is only available on VSTS which presumably will appear on premises at some future update. The core to any release process is the build. We can see in this build that it has been modified slightly from the VSTS default. The key is that we use a couple of custom build tasks to version all of our DLL assemblies. This is done by editing the assembly info.cs file prior to the compilation of our product and versioning our DAT packs, our SSDT database tools, after the production of the package. Some tools and packages need to be versioned prior to compilation, some after. In both cases we're using custom activities that I have created. These are available in the Visual Studio Marketplace. So if we go into the Marketplace we can actually search for the ones I created and you see there's a range of them. Uh, there's a whole range now of third-party tasks to do all sorts of different jobs and these are the key to providing a DevOps strategy with VSTS, whether it be via releases or builds, in that you can add functionality to the build process to extend that build process, whether you're running it on Windows-based machines using the PowerShell-based clients or whether you're using the Node-based cross-platform tools. Uh, if there isn't a tool there that does what you want, you can always write it yourself. But remember, you can always fall back to running a script in the appropriate language to the platform you're running on. So if you're running PowerShell, you can run a PowerShell script. You can run that PowerShell script on the agent machine or remotely on another machine. This is the core of the way DevOps is being delivered with VSTS. If we return to our build, we can actually look to see what this build is actually doing. We can see it's taking a .NET solution, in this case it's a website, it's a copy of the Fabric and Fiber solution. It's versioning it, it's running our unit tests, so it's running the tests that can be run in memory without databases or underlying communications. It's then copying the files that have been built, so in our case our test DLLs because those are unit tests and integration tests we'd like to run as part of our release pipeline and you can also see that we're picking up the contents of the publish folder now you might say well what is the publish folder where has that come from if we look back at to what to see what we're actually building in our solution we can see we're using the publish option so we're actually using an MS deploy package the MS deploy package is the output of our build process and we have customize that such that all of the web config settings that we need to set to enable our website in production or test or QA or whatever stage we want to are exposed through this package. This is going to become a key step in what we're doing with our release pipeline. We are aiming in this build to build an MS deploy package that can be deployed to many stages. 
integration, testing, production, whatever. It, it all depends on what cycle you need. We don't rebuild the product between stages. We only build it once. I think the key thing to remember here is you want the output of your build process to be the packaged item that you wish to deploy suitably parameterized. So in our case it's MS Deploy, but if we were pointing out a uh, MSI package, the output of the build process, the thing that ends up in the artifact drop, should be an MSI file. The key is you build what you want to deploy. We don't deploy it here, though the tools would allow us to. There is nothing stopping us adding tasks that would allow a deployment, but we leave the deployment task to the release phase because there we can add approvals and any extra steps that we wish to do. If we now have a look at the build history, we can see that our build ran and we can actually see we have our test results for the tests that were actually run inside the build. We can see our code coverage. We can also see associated TFS work items, etc. And if we go and have a look inside our artifacts and explore into them, we can see that we have our website with its MS Deploy package as well as having the DLLs we previously mentioned. So now we have something that is ready to be deployed. To do that we use the release management tools that are included in VSTS and again these are now available in TFS on-prem 2015.2 and later. We can see here that we have defined a release pipeline called DevOps. Now a DevOps pipeline doesn't have to deliver just one build. You can see in our case we have our Fabrican master build as our primary, our first build that's involved in our system, but we're also linking to a second build. So this is a way for your releases to actually concatenate the results of multiple builds or systems into what are logical, sensible releases for you to actually push out into your labs or production. You may also notice at this point that the release tooling looks remarkably similar to the build tooling and this is because it is built upon the same build agents. It does the same work. Now this doesn't mean you actually use the same physical build agents unless you want to. You can have separate agents for separate jobs, separate agents for separate stages in your release pipeline. But the key is it's the same technology. So tasks that you may choose to use in the build process may be useful to you to be reused inside the release process. Looking down this release process, you can see we have quite a few stages. You may actually notice that quite a few of them are greyed out, and that's purely because I'm just going to discuss them as I'm going down, showing you a few alternatives. The first one that we see is quite an interesting one, and this is arguably the big change that's becoming an enabler at the moment, particularly when Azure is being used. Here we're using ARM, Azure Resource Management, to define our configuration of our infrastructure as code. We have a solution inside Visual Studio that using a JSON based schema language has defined all of the services that are required inside Azure for our application, in this case an Azure SQL DB, a website, appropriate networking, firewall ports, all those sorts of things and usernames. All of the configuration that would normally be done by the IT Pro to go and build the system. Here, this is all stored as code. We then use this activity inside our release pipeline to tell Azure to go and provision a copy of this environment for us. In this case, we tell it that we're using an Azure resource management template. It is worth noting at this point that you can either use the new Azure Resource Management Template model or the older Azure Classic model way of working. Uh, you'll see this choice on quite a few build tasks where Azure is involved. Older ones tend to use the Classic model, newer ones tend to use Resource Management model. If there isn't a drop down, it's probably going to use the old Classic way, but you'll see that phasing out as time goes on. But anyway, 
we're telling it we're using Azure Resource Manager. We give it details of our Azure subscription, which is stored securely inside VSTS. So we can have a number of Azure subscriptions. You may be using one Azure subscription for your testing phase, whereas you're using a completely different one for your production phase. And those uh, Azure subscriptions can be security trimmed. So there only certain people can make use of release pipelines that push into them. We then tell it we want to create or update a new resource group, which is another interesting point here, that if the resource group that we're asking to create already exists, it will use the template to make sure what is in production matches our template and alter it appropriately. It's what's called ID impotent. It doesn't try and repeat anything, it just tries to make it right. So this can be a very good way if you want to change your specification at some point in the future. You don't necessarily have to rip everything down. You could choose to change what is already up in production. Though you may choose in other cases that it makes more sense to rip it down and replace it because you now have a reliable way of doing your deployment. We then tell it where we're going to deploy it to. We tell it where the template is and importantly we pass in a pile of parameters that are specific to our, in this case, our integration lab deployment. Inside our integration lab, we have configured a collection of variables that are specific to this version machine names, passwords, URLs, anything that we need to set. These are the entries that are going to eventually in many cases end up in our web config, but some of them need to be passed to the infrastructure first, i.e. the server names. So that can be passed in at this point. So that means we have this nice generic ARM template that could build our integration lab, our QA lab, our production system, and the, we're passing in parameters to configure any specific area. Now, if you're interested in Azure Resource Templates, Azure Resource Manager, during this Tech Days event, there will be other sessions that talk to these technologies. I could, if I wanted to, deploy a DAT pack to SQL Azure. That would be one possible way for me to manage my database that I need for this system. Now, in my sample here, I'm actually using Entity Framework Migrations, so the DAT pack stuff has been cancelled out. But you can see here, it is simple again. I give it my Azure subscription. I pass it the name of my DAT pack and I pass it a few parameters so it knows where to actually put in the database, usernames, passwords, etc. It becomes straightforward and notice that many of these parameters that we're passing in here are ones that are shared with the ARM template. So we're not duplicating information. By some careful design, we're making sure that our variables can be reused. I then use a task that does it replaces the tokens. Now this isn't an out-the-box task, this is one that actually comes from the marketplace and it's from Collins ALM Corner Build Tasks which is a very nice little collection of tasks for doing uh, a lot of stuff to do with deployment. So this one actually replaces the values in the set parameters file that we created as part of our MS deploy with values that were stored as configuration values for our integration release stage. This is a very nice way, I find, of making sure that we get our web config set up in a very easy, straightforward way. We don't have to pass through all the parameters here. This task will do the job for us by looking and matching parameters in the XML file with parameters in memory, and it does it using some regular expressions to help us find uh, the correct items to match. Notice it also does have a rather useful little uh, feature. Uh, you are able to store configuration variables as secure inside uh, release management, but uh, they are not placed in memory as environmental variables on the agent machines, unlike ordinary configuration variables. This task does give you a little sort of backdoor way that you can inject any of your secret variables so they remain secret. They're not stored in memory, but they can still be used for updating files if needed. So now we have our machines created, we've sorted out our web config, and we need to actually do our MS deploy. Now we have three ways to do that. One is we could use the standard Microsoft Azure web deployment task. But the problem we have here is it doesn't use the set parameters file, which is a bit of a shame as we've just updated it. You're expected to put in any configuration variables inside the additional arguments. 
I find that a rather awkward way of working. Maybe the next simple one is just run a batch file. We could uh, just call the deployment batch file that is created as part of uh, the MS deploy package. We have to pass in a couple of parameters, uh, the publish URL and user credentials to force it out to be pushed out to Azure, but that works perfectly well. There's no problem working that way. But again, another one of the tasks from uh, Collins ALM Corners package is uh, a web deploy. And this does exactly the same as the standard one, but it makes use of the set parameters file. Again, all we do is we pass it the folder that the MS deploy package is in, and it works out the rest for us. We just have to give it the name of the target site to send. So when this is all completed, what we have is new infrastructure created, our website has been created because our website happens to use entity framework migrations that has already created our database for us. Uh, so in theory we're up and running now but we would like to run some tests. I have some integration tests I want to run and these are standard components for running tests and the task for running tests. Uh, and I also have some Selenium based tests. The reason I've chosen Selenium over Coded UI, you may have noticed there was some Coded UI in my build, is because Selenium tests can be run headless in that they don't require the test agent that's running the tests to be running on the UI thread, uh, which isn't always the default for any build agents. I'm happening to use VSTS's hosted build agents where the build agents run as services inside Azure VMs. So they don't have access to the UI thread. But with Selenium, by using the Phantom JS driver, you can actually make use of uh, UI tests inside a service. So hence my use of Selenium. So I have integration tests, which actually test some web service endpoints that I have. These are just written with unit tests, and I have my Selenium tests. Now in both cases, these tests work perfectly well on my developer's machine, but actually they have hard-coded URLs to the URL on my developer machine, which isn't what I want for integration tests. So I actually make use of the replace tokens technology again to update the config files for my test DLLs, in this case the integration test, and down here the one for the Selenium test. This allows me to inject the correct value for the website deployed as part of this release pipeline, thus allowing me to set the correct URL for this environment. The final step in this process is to actually delete the resource group, the usual resource group that I created in stage one. Now because the way VSTS build and release works, a step in a build or a release is only done if the previous one was successful by default. So you can overrule that setting, but that is the normal behavior. So we actually only get to this final step in the process to delete the items if every step previously has worked. So we built it, we deployed it, we have tested it, and everything has been okay. None of our tests have failed. So actually, what would we want to have a look at in this integration test? Nothing really. So we might as well throw it away and free up the resource. So this means our integration test environment probably only lives for a few minutes as part of our build release pipeline. Once our integration stage has been completed successfully, the build is automatically passed to the QA stage. Now here we've used the approval mechanism to say that it has to be approved before it can actually start to go into the QA environment. Now this is the key difference between the build and release. Build is just a list of tasks and they get run. There is no human interaction. With the release tooling you can set entry or exit criteria that have to be approved by a human being or multiple human beings for a piece of code to move from one stage to another. So in our case, we automatically went into the integration phase and all of that was run and there was no quality gate where a human would actually set anything. But the QA stage, we're only allowed to enter that if either myself or Rick is 
able to confirm that we are ready for it to go into that stage. So a good analogy here would be, a common way of working would be that whenever the product is built and successfully built, it automatically triggers the integration stage to do integration tests and run some selenium tests. If all of those work, we think we have a viable product. So we'd like a human tester to have a look at it. But we don't necessarily want to thrust this new build straight for the uh, into the QA team to have a look at because they might be busy working on something else. So we mark it as ready and available for them and they actually trigger its release into their environment only when they are ready to do it. And here we see that we actually just have a very simplified version of exactly the same as we had in the integration stage. We create an Azure resource group that defines all of our system. We're taking the same parameters, but their values are different for the QA environment. And that's a little hard to see there, but if we actually look on the configuration tab and select the environments, you can see that there are some differences between the different environments. We do the same replace tokens, we do our web deploy, and here we could choose to rerun our integration tests and rerun our Selenium tests, but in this case we've chosen not to. And most importantly, we don't delete the environment because we assume a human is going to log on to it and do their exploratory testing, draft their new tests, whatever is required. And you can see how this same process could be have a next stage, which would be to go to production, in which case that to reach production, it may be that it has to be signed off by the dev lead, the QA lead, and the integration manager. If we now go back and have a look at the releases, we can see we're getting a view as to how successful they've been. We can flip in and have a look at the overviews, and we can see that release 61 is uh, successfully gone through the integration phase but hasn't yet made it into QA which is still looking at release 60. If I want to trigger it so that release 61 moves on I just go into the approval mechanism assuming I've got a suitable right so I hit approve and the job will be queued to go off into the next stage so it's now pending waiting for an agent if we look at the logs we can actually see it starting to go off the key point to note is that now our release has been made through our various stages we can see its success we can see the detailed integration tests we can see all of our uh, UI tests as well and we have the full audit and traceability that we're looking at for our product. So in summary, it's important to remember that DevOps is a process not a technology solution. There isn't a DevOps in a box. It, your mileage will vary from other people's. You need to find what DevOps mean for your organization. This might mean that you can take code from dev into test straight into production. For other organizations that's not immediately possible or desirable and so other scenarios may be appropriate. Configuration as code is a key enabler for all of this automation. The biggest change in the past year or so is the ease which Azure, with Azure Resource Management, makes it for provisioning infrastructure as part of your release process. Now that is not to say that technologies aren't available to do that that don't rely on Azure Resource Management. The Chef and Puppet and these technologies are being discussed in other sessions during the Tech Days event. But configuration of code as a broad technology sweep is a key enabler. But no one tool is going to solve everything. VSDS, especially with the ARM templates, does provide you an extensive range of tools for you to build a pipeline. Now this might mean you take existing batch files and just drop them into the pipeline and run them. But equally it might mean that you make use of tasks that are available in the library that do exactly the jobs you need to deploy MS Deploy packages as I was doing in this session. So I hope this session has been useful to give you an overview of the type of things that are possible using VSTS release management and I'm sure you'll find lots of other ideas in other sessions during this Tech Days event. Um, 
Here are a few links for the extensions that I've written and other ones that I've mentioned. Uh, I comment on all sorts of things on my blog. A lot of the posts of late have been in the DevOps space. You may find that useful. Um, you can also find the source for all of my extensions and a whole pile of other PowerShell automation um, up on my GitHub repo. With that, thanks for listening and enjoy the rest of the Tech Days event. Hello, my name is Richard Fennell and I'm the Engineering Director at Black Marble, a Microsoft Grill partner based in the north of England. As I travel around the country visiting clients, many of them are looking at their DevOps story. They're looking at how they can better integrate their software development lifecycle into their production systems, taking regular deliveries coming out of their development teams, pushing those into production in a controlled and suitably instrumented manner to make it easier for their development teams to provide the new features that their clients want and their IT teams to provide stable, reliable systems. In this session we'll look at the tools that are available inside VSTS to give you a DevOps solution. This can be applied whether you're using Azure or not. So, without more ado, let's have a look at the demo. This is done by editing the assemblyinfo.cs file prior to the compilation of our product and versioning our DAT packs, our SSDT database tools, after the production of the package. Some tools and packages need to be versioned prior to compilation, some after. In both cases we're using custom activities that I have created. These are available in the Visual Studio Marketplace. So if we go into the Marketplace we can actually search for the ones I created and you see there's a range of them. Uh, there's a whole range now of third-party tasks to do all sorts of different jobs and these are the key to providing a DevOps strategy with VSTS whether it be via releases or builds in that you can add functionality to the build process to extend that build process whether you're running it on Windows based machines using the PowerShell based clients or whether you're using the node based cross platform tools. Uh, if there isn't a tool there that does what you want you can always write it yourself but remember you can always fall back to running a script in the appropriate language to the platform you're running on. So if you're running PowerShell, you can run a PowerShell script. You can run that PowerShell script on the agent machine or remotely on another machine. This is the core of the way DevOps is being delivered with VSTS. If we return to our build, we can actually look to see what this build is actually doing. We can see it's taking a .NET solution, in this case it's a website, it's a copy of the Fabric and Fiber solution. It's versioning it, it's running our unit tests, so it's running the tests that can be run in memory without databases or underlying communications. It's then copying the files that have been built, so in our case our test DLLs because those are unit tests and integration tests we'd like to run as part of our release pipeline and you can also see that we're picking up the contents of the publish folder now you might say well what is the publish folder where has that come from if we look back at to what to see what we're actually building in our solution we can see we're using the publish option so we're actually using an MS deploy package the MS deploy package is the output of our build process and we have customize that such that all of the web config settings that we need to set to enable our website in production or test or QA or whatever stage we want to are exposed through this package. This is going to become a key step in what we're doing with our release pipeline. We are aiming in this build to build an MS deploy package that can be deployed to many stages. Integration testing on the screen you can see the VSTS dashboard. This has been customised a little from the default to highlight the tooling that's available to us. The key main areas we need to consider are the build reports and the release management reports. Now the build reports are available on VSTS and TFS 
At the moment, the release report, the release widget for the dashboard is only available on VSTS, which presumably will appear on premises at some future update. The core to any release process is the build. We can see in this build that it has been modified slightly from the VSTS default. The key is that we use a couple of custom build tasks to version all of our DLL assemblies 